Well, good morning, church. How are we doing today? Hey, come on. Let's stand up. Let's worship the Lord this morning. He is worthy of our praise. We enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Let's lift our voice together today. On eyes on your faithfulness, oh God, let me not forget to sing in the valley, to look toward your goodness. Oh, my heart set on who you are. You're the light that consumes the dark. Jesus died for me. 
just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Your name is life
of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord this morning. You may be seated. We're going to enter into a, a time of prayer, and so if you'd like to, you're welcome to come to the altar um, here forward this morning or adjust your posture in your seats. Uh, we're getting ready to sing a song called In Christ Alone. You might be familiar with that song uh, for many of you, and I thought I would just read one of the passages of Scripture that much of this song is based on. It comes from Psalm 62, and so I'm going to read verses 1 through 8 for us. It says, I'm at rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will never be shaken. How long will you threaten a man? Will all of you attack as if you were leaning wall or a tottering fence? The only plan to bring him down from his high position. They take pleasure in lying. They bless with their mouths, but they curse inwardly. But rest in God alone, my soul, for my hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will not be shaken. My salvation and glory depend on God, my strong rock. My refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before him, for God is our refuge. So the theme of this psalm is that God is not simply our hope and safety when we die, but that God is also our only hope and safety as we live. And and I think that's one thing that's often forgotten when we think about the gospel. Uh, We know that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried and he was resurrected so that we could experience uh, mercy in the day of judgment and so that we could experience the grace of God and, and dwell with him eternally. But we forget that the gospel is also hope for us today. Because if God has dealt with our greatest needs in Jesus, then how much more will he take care of us in the little things? And so I, I wanna kind of ask a few questions here and lead you in a few moments of prayer. In the face of pain or difficult circumstances, we find ourselves looking to other things, I think, for comfort and for refuge, things that don't truly provide for us. And so what do you look for? What do you look to in the face of anxiety? What are you banking on in your life? Maybe what are the things that you turn to in suffering or in pain? How do you typically respond? Take a moment, confess the ways that you've taken refuge in things apart from God. Now, in the midst of those things, thank God. Thank him that he's demonstrated his trustworthiness by forgiving your sins and making a way for salvation. finally ask God. Ask God to help you trust in him more, to commit to him wholeheartedly as your refuge in life today. Father, we're we're so often looking to other things beside you, things that we think provide us comfort and safety and security, things that uh, they, they might provide for a moment, but that seem to just fade away. And so Lord, I pray that this morning be a day when many of us recognize how we've turned from you even in these little moments as we respond to the challenges, the worries, the, the, the frustrations, the pains of life. And Lord, that we remember as your gospel is proclaimed, that you're trustworthy, that you're the only source of eternal comfort and provision, and that you've demonstrated that you desire that for us by giving your son Jesus to die for our sins. Lord, I pray that many people come to an understanding of the gospel that goes beyond just salvation in the future, 
but into a salvation for today. One that leads us to a great relationship with you, a hope in you. Lord, in you alone, our hope is found, not just for the future, but for now. So I pray as we sing this next song, Lord, you make that clear to us. You help that truth resonate with us. You give us comfort, strength, and encouragement that only you can provide. And I ask this in your name, amen.
till he returns or calls me home. Here, in the power of Christ, I will stand. And I trust that is true in your life this morning as well. We have much, much to live for. Amen? Amen. Father, we come to you this morning with full hearts, with excitement, with joy, with anticipation. Father, thank you for moving and working in this place this morning. God, it is good to be together. Good to be together to celebrate you and what you're doing what you've done and look forward to what you're going to do. God, this morning as we lifted up the name that is above every name, Father, I pray now that as we dive into your word, into the scriptures, that you will draw us closer to you this morning. Father, thank you. Thank you that you sent your son to this earth to live that perfect life, to ultimately go to the cross, be crucified, and then go to the grave to raise victorious one day. God, thank you. Thank you for the price that was paid for us. Lord, as we dig into the scriptures this morning, speak to us. As Pastor Sean speaks this morning, God, I pray he brings your word with boldness and fire today. I'm excited to hear from him. I'm excited to hear from you and your spirit this morning, Father. Speak to us. In your great and matchless name I pray. Amen. Good morning. How many of you this year set a goal or maybe a habit that you want to work towards of being healthy, maybe running more or or working out more? How many? All right, there's not that many hands. It sounds like that was not this year's goal, Um, but that's all right. Uh, You see, ever since I uh, retired from playing soccer, and I use retired uh, because it sounds better than I quit, um, but I grew up playing soccer all the way into college, and I loved playing soccer, but I hated running. And you're like, that doesn't work. And the easy solution was I played goalie, all right? Uh, But I hate running. To this day, when I quit soccer, I was like, man, I'm going to avoid running at all costs. Unless I'm being chased by somebody, I'm not running. I'm just not doing it. I much rather do so many other things like ride a bike, go swimming, rowing, whatever. I much rather get my cardio any other way. And, and I say this because normally what we do is we come to the scriptures and, and you heard uh, Pastor Tim say we're going to dive into his word today. We're certainly going to do that. Uh, but sometimes we say the words that we're going to, you know, walk through the scriptures this morning. Uh, That is not what we're doing this morning. This morning, we're going to go for a jog through the scriptures, maybe even run at some point. And so I hope you're ready for Bible cardio this morning. All right. And so open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. And you know, we run or we do cardio because we want to be healthy. We want to live a healthy life. And Jesus actually wants the same thing for us. He wants us to live a healthy life. But he has a different word to talk about this. It's called a righteous life. To live a righteous life. And so this morning, we're going to look at what it means to live righteously. And to do that, we're going to see that we have to have a right heart. So the big idea this morning is that right living comes from having a right heart. And by the end, I hope you see that there is only one way for us to have a right heart, but that a right heart lives out these examples that Jesus gives us in these verses. Now, the Bible talks about righteousness in two different ways. The first idea of righteousness is to be declared righteous or to be declared right before God. 
And, that, and we know that that only happens because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that we can be made right before God, where he took our sin on the cross, our unrighteousness on the cross, paid the penalty of our sins, and now gives us his righteousness. So that's the first type of righteousness. The second one is what is called right living. And we can also look at Jesus' life and see that he was the ultimate example of what it means to live rightly before God. However, what we find out through the Old Testament is that this was the expectation of all of God's people, to live right before God. In the Old Testament, God gave through Moses, right on the, on the mount, Mount Sinai, he gave to them the law. Most of us probably think of the Ten Commandments, right? There's, there's many more laws written in the Old Testament, but he gave them to his people for, so that they could know what it means to live in right standing before God. And that doesn't change for us today. However, Jesus does something a little bit different with the law. And in the same way that Moses stood before uh, the people at Mount Sinai, Jesus opens up the Sermon on the Mount by standing on a mountainside, teaching his disciples this new law that he is giving. And today that is where we begin. We un we're going to unpack what it means to be a follower of Jesus and how he expects us to live rightly before God. So remember that big idea as we keep running, jogging through the scriptures this morning, that right living comes from a right heart. Verse 17 in Matthew 5. Don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Therefore, Whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So when we read this passage, we get, two, we get introduced to two groups of people, the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes are a group of people around the time of Jesus who just spent their time in God's word. They would write God's word. They would be the ones who would rewrite God's word and, and distribute it to the people. People would come to them for understanding about the law. And then we have the Pharisees, and these were the master practitioners and teachers of the law. When Jesus came before the people and before his disciples teaching about what righteous living is, everyone would have looked and turned to the Pharisees as the ultimate example of what it means to live rightly before God. And Jesus, at the end of this statement, that last verse, he says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the scribes, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is calling his followers to a righteousness that surpasses the norm of the day. A righteousness that is more than what all of the example of people around them would look to. And the central issue that we come to is that the law has been established, it has been given to Israel hundreds of years before the time of Jesus. And yet Jesus stands before this people giving them a new law. And so the question is, what is the relationship between the old law, the Torah, and this new law, or this new Torah that Jesus is about to explain to us? And so we can look today, and it is understandable to go, Jesus, what are you doing? You can't, you can't do that. And yet, as Messiah and truly the Son of God, he is the one who is able to give us the true explication of the law the actual meaning of what the law was supposed to be and ultimately always intended, its intended purposes, he is now going to unpack that to his followers. And the question that we might have is, why hasn't Jesus given us this teaching before? And that's a great question. Jesus tells us the answer to that too. Matthew 19, verse 8, it says, He told them, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your hearts. But it was not like that from the beginning. 
God's desire was and always is the teaching that we're about to hear from Jesus this morning. The issue was that as sinful people with a hardened heart, we would never be able to live up to that expectation. And so the first thing that must happen for us to live rightly before God is that God has to change our heart. And we're going to get there at the end of this message and and you're going to see that unfold because these things that Jesus is about to unpack for us, these six examples, we're going to look at those and go, there's no way we can't do that. There's no way in our own power we can do that. We're going to need some help. And Jesus offers those things. So let's go to our Bible, get our Bible cardio on this morning. We're going to go through these six examples, and then I'm going to add an example uh, as well. And so there's going to be a table on the screen in front of you eventually, and there's, you're going to want seven spaces, all right? I'm warning you now, uh, but we're going to start going through these. So first passage here this morning, Matthew, 21, verse, uh, Matthew 5, verse 21 through 26. You've heard that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder And whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court. Whoever says, you fool, will be subject to hellfire. Here's his first example. So if you are offering your gift on the altar, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Second example, reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way with him to the court, or your adversary will hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer, and you'll be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you that you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. So here's Jesus' formula for this the the section here, right? He's going to say, this is what you've heard. You have heard it said, and he's going to talk about the old law, right? The Torah. But but I tell you, new law, new Torah. And so this is going to be the example that we see play out over these next examples. And so Jesus doesn't just stop at the external requirement of the law. He goes into an inner attitude, an issue with our heart, and then gives us an antidote to that issue. In this first one, we see that the external requirement under the law for Israel is not to murder. How many of you in this room just went, check, haven't done that before, good. I'm helping all of us. Uh, But (laughs) Jesus' words to you would be, great. You have the same righteousness as the Pharisees. But what I said at the beginning of this, that your righteousness would have to surpass that of the Pharisees. So what's the issue here? Jesus gets right to the issue. The issue in an inner attitude of anger is what produces murder. Anger. The requirement for Jesus' followers is not don't murder, but it's to check our anger. To check our anger. And when we are angry, a right heart doesn't go to murder, it goes to something else, reconciliation. When we look at this, uh, and, and reconcile, just for clarity, reconcile means to bring harmony or peace. To bring harmony or peace. So we are to be reconcilers. You can see this unfold in the table here, that the external requirement is do not murder, The inner attitude is one of anger, and the antidote to that anger then is reconciliation. The requirement for followers of Jesus then is is to be harmony bringers. We're to bring harmony into the world, to bring harmony in relationships with the people around us. That's why in Jesus' first example, he goes, uh, he's talking about a person who goes to worship God at the temple and he's laying a sacrifice down on the altar and he says, if you remember that there's somebody that you're angry with or is angry with you, stop. Stop. Don't do the sacrifice. Walk away. Go and be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come back and worship. It's because Jesus knows that our relationship with other people will always impact our relationship with him. Every time. 
And as long as there is sin, and specifically anger in the church, then worship will always be compromised. Always. And as believers, as followers of Jesus, a right heart, when we experience anger, does not turn to murder or malice, but it turns to reconciliation. Let's look at this next example that Jesus gives us. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If you're right, here's that first example again. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better than that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. <clears throat> These next two examples are about sexual ethics in the kingdom of God. Jesus is, starts his teaching on sexual ethics here. And you can see in the chart that the external requirement of the law, the Torah, was do not commit adultery. And the issue of the inner attitude is one of lust. And the example, the antidote to this then is to remove it. Remove the lust in your heart. Get rid of it at all costs. Jesus' example of this was if your right eye causes you to sin, then dig it out and get rid of it. And, right? Like, wow, that is crazy. Jesus takes sin seriously. And he takes sexual sin very seriously. That's a big deal. That second example talks about sin in general. That all sins are a big deal and need to be dealt with in the heart of the believer. In 1 Corinthians 6, 18, it tells us, flee sexual immorality. Run from it. Get rid of it. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. Sexual integrity is a big deal to Jesus. And so is every sin. And so as a follower of Jesus, we are to put off our sin. We are to flee from our sin. And that involves two things. The first thing is that we ask Jesus to forgive our sins. We ask for forgiveness. The second thing is, instead of walking over and over towards our sin, towards those habitual sins in our life, we turn, which is called repentance, we turn, we repent from our sin, and we start walking after Jesus. So that's what it looks like to repent of our sin, to ask forgiveness, to deal with lust in our heart, to deal with these sins in our heart. It's to turn away from them and go the other direction. And the other direction is a holy God. And his name is Jesus, and he died for our sins. As you can see, we're going to start moving through these passages pretty quickly. And uh, there's so much more for us to talk about. There's so many more things for us to dive in and walk through these passages to understand all of it. And we just don't have time this morning to do that. So I encourage you to get with a group of people, to go home yourself and study this. Take observations. Get with a group of people and come together and say, what is Jesus talking about here? Talk about it in your life group. If you have questions about it, come and ask a leader in the church. Come ask a pastor. We'd be happy to help have a conversation with you about one of these things or, or maybe even point you to some good resources. And the reason I say that is because there's going to be some more questions that we have as we go throughout this. And I don't want you to feel like I'm just skipping over them. I want you to know that there's, there's a lot here and we can meditate on the, this teaching of Jesus for our entire lives. It takes a life to understand and even then we will not fully comprehend all of Jesus' teaching. This next one here, verse 31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. But I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife, except in a case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. <clears throat> now, this is probably where questions are going to start coming up. Under the Old Testament law, adultery only referred to the wife's misbehavior, not the husband's. 
And, the old, and so if we want to look at what Jesus is teaching on, is on divorce and this, what followers are expected of, uh, it begins here. Uh, but there are a lot more passages for us to look at in the New Testament that talk about this. And so the Old Testament law said that all that was necessary was that the husband give you a writ of divorce and give it to you and then you're divorced and be on your way. So like last night, if uh, Jess burnt dinner, I could have just been like, Jess burnt dinner, I'm done with her. Here you go. And we could have been divorced, right? And that seems absurd. Uh, and yet, uh, we need to look at Jesus' teaching more and we're going to see that Jesus is, does not believe that that is actually the case. And there's a reason for that. We read that earlier. is because of the hardness of the hearts of people that divorce is allowed under the Old Testament law. <clears throat> what we find under this law then is this external requirement that we must give a reason for divorce. However, the inner issue, the root issue or the inner attitude in our heart is one of selfishness and our own desires. So the antidote then becomes sacrifice. And if you look at the marriage passages in the New Testament, Ephesians 5 is a good place to start. What you find is that over and over that we are to surrender or to sacrifice our own desires for the desire of the other person as the husband. <clears throat> so Jesus is saying, no, do not get divorced because you've made a covenant with that person where the two have become one flesh and that covenant is to be lifelong. And when two become one in marriage, there's a unity and a commitment for life. And so when divorce happens, there is a separation of the two. It breaks. The separation of the one into two, it breaks. And that leads us to this next example as well, talking about oaths. Again, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, you must not break your oath, but you must keep your oaths to the Lord. But I tell you, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven because it is God's throne, or by the earth because it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem because it is the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head because you cannot make a single hair white or black, but let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Anything more than this is from the evil one. <clears throat> when we look at this section, the external requirement, not to break oaths, do not break oaths. And the root or the inner attitude is one of deceit. That we're trying to persuade the person that what we're saying is true. And so we're trying to deceive them by swearing an oath. One that we have no power or ability to even act out on. And the example that Jesus gives is one where, can you change a hair on your head? If that were true, there'd probably be a whole lot less bald people in the room right? If you could actually actively stop yourself from turning gray other than with an external chemical, you'd probably do it. But you have no control even one hair on your head. How can you then swear by the earth or swear by a holy God? You're not in control. God is. And so ultimately when we have this desire in our hearts to try to deceive other people into thinking that we can be the one in control or in the one in power over a situation, that is a root, that's the root issue of sin in our heart. One that the antidote becomes honesty. As a part of Jesus' kingdom, his followers then are honest. They are truthful and there is no deceit found in them. Our yes be yes and our no be no. I think that's pretty easy application for us this morning, right? Be honest. Be honest in all things. And when you have that tendency in your heart to want to deceive a believer, a follower of Jesus, because he has been given a new heart, responds in honesty instead. Let's look at this next example. <clears throat> You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. As for the one who wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks you and don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. 
The Jewish idea here is one of equal retaliation. If you murder, you're killed. And we see that throughout the law. There's one of equal retaliation. And the Old Testament used the law as the primary means in which justice was enacted out. Jesus goes the other direction in two ways. The first one is that one of non-retaliation and submission to evil or to typify kingdom people. And the second is that not only should we refuse to seek vengeance or justice on our own behalf, but that we should also seek generosity and giving to help the very people who demand things of us. The external requirement here is fair distribution or, or to distribute fair retaliation. And the root issue or the inner attitude that we are seeking is that we are seeking our own justice. That we are trying to control fairness and justice in our life, in the lives of other people. The antidote that we see Jesus say that should be typified believers is one of grace. Not vengeance, not retaliation, but one of grace. During the Roman occupation of Israel during Jesus' time, there was a law that said that as a Roman soldier passed through a territory, he could demand that a person take all of their stuff and carry it one mile for them so that they could have a break from their armor and all the stuff that they brought as they were going throughout all of the world to conquer it. And what Jesus says to his followers here is that when that is asked of you, when you make it to the first mile, don't put the stuff down. Say, can I go with you the second? Which means that for that person who just did that, They walked two miles away from where they probably wanted to go and had to walk the two miles back. Jesus really is telling us to go the extra mile, to give grace, to lavish grace on other people. We don't repay evil with evil, but evil with goodness. Evil with grace. We give people what they don't deserve. Isn't that exactly what Jesus does? when he went to the cross for our sins, he gave us grace. And that while we are sinners, he died for us. And so as followers of Jesus, grace should be our heart posture. That should be the thing that flows out of us even to our enemies and people who hate us. One of the major objections in the Gospels is Jesus teaching on the Sabbath. And so this is kind of this extra example that I'm throwing in here before we get to the last one. You see, the the Pharisees came up against Jesus over and over against this thing. He's like, you're breaking the Sabbath. You're breaking the Sabbath. And, And what many of you might be thinking is, yeah, like if at the beginning of this passage, Jesus said, I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill, then why is he getting rid of the Sabbath? And really he's not. In fact, he's doing the exact same thing as these other examples. The external requirement is keep the Sabbath. But the inner attitude behind the Sabbath, the root sin issue is one where we work for six days and if we didn't have the Sabbath, we'd work on the seventh too because we're trying to provide for ourselves. We're trying to sustain our own lives. And so the Sabbath was put in place for a day when people could come before God, rest from their works, and realize that God was the sustainer of their life, not them. So the inner attitude, the root issue here, is one where we strive to sustain ourselves. The antidote then is pretty obvious, that we rely on Jesus. In Matthew uh, 11, 28, It says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke from me and learn, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Hebrews 4 goes on to explain this more, that Jesus is the author of rest and the first person to enter rest. And that by being a follower of Jesus, we too can enter that rest. And we will ultimately enter the kingdom rest, this new heaven and new earth one day, but we get to experience that rest today. And not just today, but tomorrow and every day. And so for the believer, 
The Sabbath becomes actually a daily practice of our lives because we rely on Jesus each and every day. This last example, Jesus summarizes all of these previous ones. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The external requirement of the law was to love your neighbor and hate your enemies. However, the root issue here is one of partiality. The antidote to this issue then is loving all people. And Jesus' illustration here is, doesn't God provide for both the righteous and the unrighteous person? Doesn't he sustain the world? Right now, I'm sure you can think of somebody who is far from God. And yet God, through his grace and mercy, loves them and has allowed and kept them living this very moment. The answer is God shows no partiality. He loves all and extends his love to all so that all might come to a saving knowledge of him through his son. Everyone loves their friends. That's not unique to following Jesus. However loving your enemies is, dying for your enemies is. In Romans 5, 8, God says this very thing. But God proves his own love for us, that while we were sinners, while we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. Loving all people becomes the underlying or the all-encompassing heart posture for following Jesus. When we summarize these examples that Jesus gives us about this higher ethical code, this new righteousness, this righteousness that surpasses that of the Pharisees, we see that this higher righteousness for those who follow Jesus is a right heart. It starts from a right heart, a heart that seeks reconciliation, that takes sin seriously, that sacrifices their own desires, that lives honestly, that extends grace, that relies on Jesus and loves everyone. As a follower of Jesus, our life is to be one of reconciliation, of taking sin seriously, of sacrificing our desires, living honestly, extending grace, relying on Jesus and loving everyone. So how do we do this? How do we do this? Right living doesn't come from right actions like the Pharisees believed. When we think that right living is about following the law, we end up in one of two places, our own pride or despair, but never in the kingdom of heaven because we need a right heart. Right living comes from a right heart. And the right heart doesn't come from us trying harder, trying to live out a set of laws or actions. It comes because we have trusted in Jesus for our salvation, that he died for our sins and then he rose again on the third day and he gives us a new heart. At the beginning of this passage, it says that all will be fulfilled from the prophets and the law. One of the prophets, Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27, says that there will be a time when God does this thing. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. It's in Jesus that we get a right heart, not from our own work. So this morning... If you are looking to live rightly, you're looking for that good life, that right life, then it should be clear that the only way that happens is when you surrender your life to Jesus and you ask him to give you a new heart to remove the sinful heart of stone that you have in your heart that has become hardened against God and remove that and give you a heart of flesh, one that is softened towards God. 
And in doing so, he will give you a new spirit, a spirit that will allow you to follow all of those things that we just talked about. Allow you to follow and have a heart that seeks reconciliation, extends grace, that loves all people. So this morning, as we sing, as prayer partners come up here, if that's you this morning, I ask you, come, share, tell somebody that you want a new heart, a right heart in Jesus. For some of us in this room, we have already trusted Jesus, but as believers, we have a new problem. You see, the Pharisees kept the law. Their problem was their heart. That's not of us as believers. We've been given a new heart. We have the right heart. So our problem is, why don't we live like it? James 2, 14 through 26 says, do not just be hearers of the law or the word, but doers as well. So during this invitation time, maybe you need to pray in your seat or come forward as well and pray and ask God that he would soften your heart and align your heart with his heart. That when you experience anger or lust or malice or uh, any one of these other things that we have talked about this morning, that he would change and soften your heart and allow you, instead of responding to in murder or adultery, to respond in reconciliation, to respond in fleeing from your sin. So this morning as the band plays, I pray that you would respond how God is leading you in your heart. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, you are so holy. You are so good. And we thank you. We thank you for the promise that you gave thousands and thousands of years ago that you would deal with our sin, that you would deal with our hardened hearts, and that you would give us a new heart that you would give up your spirit and place it in us that we might have the power to live and follow after you and your example. That as you came as Jesus, God in the flesh, that you demonstrated what it looks like to live a righteous life. And that the same spirit that rose you from the grave is the spirit that now dwells in us and empowers us to live and follow your example. This morning, I pray that as followers of you, that when we experience these inner attitudes in our heart, that we would respond the way in which you have called your people, kingdom people, to respond. And I pray for those in the room that do not know you, that still have a hard heart, that you would soften their heart and that they would today surrender their life to you. Jesus, we love you. And it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. All right, church, as we sing this morning, can we stand and, and let's, uh, let's worship the Lord. Let's think on these things that we've heard this morning and respond to the Spirit's moving. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. to the altar the Father's arms are Mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. 
Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling you. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Man, thank you, Pastor Sean. That was a, a challenging message, I think. So often we forget uh, that our right living only comes from a right heart. And so if you walk away with uh, nothing but a reminder of that, um, I think you've walked away with something that God had to say to you this morning. So just a few announcements here as we uh, finish up. If you're a guest with us, we're really thankful that you made it today. We're glad that you were here and we hope that we get a chance to connect with you a little bit more. Um, some of our pastors will be around here after the service and so you can always come talk with us. But in the back of the seat in front of you, there is what we call a connect card and you can scan a QR code there just to let us know that you're here and give us a little information about who you are. And that'll just help us to uh, catch up with you later on this week. You also can scan that card in the back of your seat if you're looking to see any of the upcoming events and things that are happening in the life of our church. I just have a few to share with you this morning. So uh, number one, I wanna share with you about our, our new members, our, our, our next steps or new members class that's happening. And so uh, it's getting ready to come up on February 8th, I think is the next one, and the 15th from 6.30 to 8. And so uh, you guys can get signed up for that if you'd like to uh, get connected to our new members class. These are a few of the people who've just gone through our most recent new members class. And so you can uh, see their photos uh, as they're being presented to you guys as people who've just joined in that process. And so really easy to get connected that way. Uh, February 8th and the 15th is the next class that you guys can do. Oh, and there's one this Saturday too. Okay, Sean's, Sean's giving me an update. We've got another one this Saturday if Wednesday night doesn't work for you. So that's good too. And that's in the morning, right at nine. Okay, perfect. And then two more things for you. Our chili cook-off and cornhole tournament's coming up soon for the men, so you guys can get excited about that. Uh, there are so many people in this church that are so good at making chili that it's just like, it's, it's a, it's a no-brainer. You've gotta get there, you've gotta taste as much chili as possible. If you can get on the roster of judges, then you know, good for you, you're gonna have a really great time. Tim is one of those people, it sounds like. Uh, but yeah, come play cornhole with us, eat some chili, it's gonna be fun. That's February 4th from six to nine. And then the last thing is our Winter Bible Conference registration is now open. And so if you guys wanna get signed up for our upcoming Winter Bible Conference, you're definitely gonna wanna make this a priority for you. It's, some, it's a way to invest in your spiritual growth and unity with our church as we get ready to start up uh, really the, the new year here. It sets some direction for us and it helps us all to come together around, God, around God's word. So we're excited about that. Make sure you guys get signed up in the days ahead. So with that, we'll just end with sharing our memory verse that we've been quoting for the last last uh, couple of weeks here. And so it'll be up on the screen behind me, I believe, and then we'll go for it. Hey, Pastor Jackson, while we're waiting on that... I mean, I can just do it if you want. No, but. <laughs> I'm just, probably all know it, but hey, I'm just interjecting this. This is quick. No, there's a guy in the building today. It's his birthday. There might be somebody else. Ooh, there's yeah. a guy today. It's his birthday. This guy is a beast in the XP world of church world. <laughs> Pastor Brian's birthday today. Yeah, yes. Pastor Brian. We love you, PD. <laughs> oh, man, thank you. Um, good reminder. All right, let's say our memory verse. We'll commit it to memory, and then we'll head out. Uh, so Matthew 6, 9 to 13 it says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, go in peace, church.